All right. Today is Thursday, July 13th. This is a recap for the stock market activities today. And folks, I got a good one for you tonight. And apologies for being late. I cannot produce two videos tonight, so we're keeping the video open for everybody. But we're going to do an options tutorial and another portfolio review for the members. That's going to happen over the weekend. And of course, we're going to do another macroeconomic discussion in the public channel this time around about China. Because a lot of you say, hey, Maverick, what about China, China, China? So we'll do China. But the reason why I'm late and I cannot produce two videos is I got a bird situation in my backyard. So I got this baby bird who fell from the nest. All of a sudden, the mother starts screaming really loud, weird noises. Next thing you know, the whole backyard is covered with birds. The whole tribe showed up. And now I know what's going on. The baby's down. It's really hot. It's not going to survive. I got to do something here. Maybe put it back in the nest. But every time I approach the baby, they get mad at me and they start attacking biting my head, like that Hitchcock movie. I'm like, okay, assholes, I'm trying to help here. But anyways, we'll see what happens because they're all surrounding the backyard right now to protect the baby and the mom is feeding him for now. So we'll see what happens. But let's dive right into it. Let's talk about the economy here because we got two important earnings report today and they tell us important things about the economy. Now, so far this season, I would say three earnings reports were the most important ones. Number one, Nike. Number two, GIS, General Mills. Number three, Tyson. All of these three showed us consumer weakness, specifically in the lower middle class, the middle class. And it was really alarming to see that the consumer is becoming really price sensitive. In the case of Tyson, if meat is too expensive, they would rather eat something else. And that tells you that there is a huge chunk of the consumer who's getting really hurt. And then you have another chunk of the consumer who are doing pretty good. They're traveling. They're having a good time. And at some point, the gap will be closed. And it all revolves around the icy hot phenomenon in the economy. We have sectors that are hot, a.k.a. inflationary. And we have sectors that are not so hot. They're icy, a.k.a. recessionary. And you can see the divergence in the stock market. If you have any retail stocks in the IC category, they're not doing pretty good. Commodity stocks, they're not doing pretty good. Manufacturing, not so hot so. But then you look at the hot sector of the economy. Any stocks relating to travel and leisure, doing pretty good. Any stocks relating to construction and housing, doing excellent. Stocks relating to food, services, doing pretty good. We talked about new cars. We can add new cars in the hot category. And now all of a sudden the manufacturers, Ford, GM, doing pretty good as of late. And unfortunately, yours truly only caught one mania, which is the construction mania. And that's it. If you looked at my portfolio review, I wish I caught more of them. But the AI mania side, that's a bubble because it's not based on any economics. But these right here, if you look at any construction stock, they're acting as AI stocks, but they have fundamentals behind them. Likewise, when you look at, for example, when we look at new cars, the stock of AutoNation, the stock of Penske, all acting as AI stocks, but they have a lot of fundamentals behind them. And of course, the most recent example is Delta Airlines. It's in the travel and leisure. That stock been flying high as an AI stock. And we now know we have fundamentals behind that because it's in the hot side of the economy. And we have this, uh, I hate this terminology, but the Goldilocks environment right now, although it kind of expired, but one step at a time. In the first half of the year, energy inflation was going down, but consumer demand in these sectors was still way too hot. Therefore, the margins of these companies improved dramatically and delta airline is an example but it also comes with a warning to begin with if we look at jet fuel prices they went down big for the year since they peaked back in 22 so right off the gate that's a relief for delta airline and any airline company because they pay less for jet fuel but they can charge more for tickets the margins expand dramatically and therefore here's the headline delta posts record quarterly earnings Hikes full year outlook and travel boom. So let's look at these earnings. Right off the gate, we'll look at passenger revenues up 21% year on year. That's pretty good. All in all, operating revenues up 13% for the year. You look at expenses. Here's the bad part, the wage inflation part. Salaries up 25% for the year. But it was offset by jet fuel costs down 22% for the year. All in all, operating expenses are up 6% for the year. When we look at the operating margin, this year it's 16%. Operating margin, by the way, means how much does the company keep in profits out of every single dollar in revenue. So it's a really important metric. 16% this year, 11% last year. It's a decent report. 
But what is the problem here and the warning sign for all of us in this economy? Every other company, salaries. So you have relief from energy costs, but wages continue to go higher. In other words, what does that mean? They're going to pass the extra cost all the way down to us consumers. Prices will go higher. And if consumers stop responding to higher prices and they become price sensitive, the margins get crushed right away. But luckily for Delta right now, they're not facing this problem at least not right now, but here's the upcoming headwind. Look at the correlation between jet fuel and crude oil prices. We talked about crude rebounding. And if you look at the chart of uh, Brent oil, this is a weekly chart. Clearly, we have a breakout coming. And as the dollar goes down, crude prices will go higher. And with that, jet fuel costs. So maybe the Goldilocks environment for Delta is over if we see a rebound in crude oil prices and jet fuel prices, most importantly. Then what happens? The relief that they got this quarter will be no longer. And on top of that, they have the headwind from wages moving higher. And the question becomes, when will the consumer crack? Because if the consumer crack, then you have a company with higher expenses from jet fuel costs rebounding and salaries remaining too high. But the consumer is too weak to spend and therefore the margins come down collapsing. So there is a huge risk here in Delta and many other airlines. Then we got a name that I own in my portfolio and a lot of you own too, PepsiCo. And the headline reads, PepsiCo price hikes steady demand at sparkle to annual forecast pay attention now pepsico raised its annual forecast on tuesday after price hikes underline price hikes undertaken to offset higher costs and steady demand underline steady demand helped the soda and snack giant beat first quarter results and by the way i believe that pepsico never missed never they only missed back in 09 Anyways, the results pointed to a resilient consumer. Here we go. We'll see how resilient in a minute, but and followed similar quarterly performance by rival Coca-Cola and Nestle. PepsiCo shares rose 2% in early trading. Listen to this. Average prices jumped by 16% in the first quarter, PepsiCo said, while organic volume slipped by 2%. In other words, this uh, upbeat performance by PepsiCo, it's not because folks are buying more. It's because they're raising prices more on those consumers who are still able to spend. Continuing, global consumer goods companies have raised prices since the pandemic to battle a jump in costs of raw materials, labor, and shipping. We do not expect commodity prices to decrease for us. Really important. Only the rate of inflation will get a little better, a bit lighter, excuse me, during the course of the year. This is according to the CFO Hugh Johnston of PepsiCo. In other words, when you hear CPI down year on year 3%, in real life, when you go down to the grocery store, you're still paying more. In real life, a company like PepsiCo is still paying more for their input cost. In other words, the inflationary process is still here, regardless of the cooking of the numbers. Meanwhile, the Frito-Lay makers also plans to raise prices in some regions, in contrast to its decision earlier this year to hit a pause. I wonder why they're raising prices. We have to look at the numbers. Revenues up 10.36% year on year. Cost to sales up 7.5% year on year. That's good. The growth rate in revenues exceeding the growth rate in the cost to sales. So margins are pretty good. But here's the problem. Selling general and administrative costs up 15.63% for the year. That's wages, baby. Do you see with your own eyes that this is a problem? And they're going to have to raise prices or eat margin loss in the future. The operating profit, if we look at the operating margin, 16.39% this year versus 10.27% last year. Really impressive for PepsiCo. But at some point, they're going to face these higher wages. Anyhow, the net income for the company up by 92.30% for the year. Unbelievable. Do we see any weakness here in PepsiCo? If we look at the categories one by one, the answer is yes. If we look at revenues, Africa, Middle East, South Asia, that's uh, down a little bit year on year. Every other category is up year on year. Then we'll look at the profits. A little bit of a problem here in Quaker. Down slightly, but they can fix that with another price hike. But we see again the problem in Africa, Middle East, South Asia. Profits are down slightly year on year. But here's the most important part. You look at all of these categories. We see growth in revenues, growth in profits. Where is that coming from? Not because they're selling more. You see the organic volume? That's down across the board. But because they're raising prices. This economy is now hanging by a thread. The input cost for companies is increasing higher. And a huge segment of the consumer is weakening. Hence, we see lower volumes. But there is another segment that is still doing pretty good. And companies right now, like PepsiCo, are surviving on raising prices on that segment. The question becomes, what if that segment weakens too, due to the lag impacts 
when the Fed raising rates higher. I shared this with you before, which is excess savings in the USA, already negative if you look at it as a percentage of GDP. I don't like this metric. I'd rather look at this one, cumulative excess savings. So right now, this year, we entered the year with excess savings of about $500 billion among households. This is set to go down to negative by September or October maximum of this year. Then what happens? Will the consumer be able to pay more for the tickets by Delta or pay more for the products by PepsiCo? And if they can't, then what happens? The margins for companies will collapse and they will have to get rid of employees. And here we go. The lag impacts of raising interest rates by the Fed at some point guaranteed 1 million percent. The unemployment rate will rise higher and this economy will be in a recession. Now, let's talk about some trade ideas because uh, this is what we do in the morning brief for the members on Discord. Let's look at some of these ideas. Some work, some doesn't, but it gives us an idea of the outliers. Things that went way too high, too fast, do for a pullback. Things that went down, maybe too aggressively and do for a bounce. We start with today's morning brief. You can pause it, read all the commentary, but we look at the charts, few opportunities, long, we have AMD. Momentum is firming and a closing above the 20 days moving average will confirm a shift from bearish to bullish momentum. Here's the chart for AMD that I shared with you in the morning. Here's the update. We got a closing above the 20 days moving average. The RSI is shifting from bearish to bullish and soon enough the MACD. Is it a guarantee that AMD will move higher? Of course not. But we look at the charts, we follow the technicals and that's all we can do. If we have an ugly day because JP Morgan blew up tomorrow, of course everything will go down. But this is what the chart says for now. Then we'll look at GOOGL, Google, the boss. Similar with AMD. A closing above the 20 days moving average will restore bullish momentum. And we're using the Bollinger Bands, of course, for these kind of trades. This is the chart in the morning. This is the update. Massive pop for GOOGL. Closing above the 20 days moving average. The chart says higher it goes. Now again, can we crash tomorrow because we have bad news? Sure. But this is what the chart says for now. If we zoom out in the weekly chart, this could be a bull flag. Whenever broken below 117, my number. So this could be, in the bullish case, a bull flag formation that could take the stock all the way to closing the gap at 133.29. Then we'll look at MDLZ, Mondelez, due to a rebound or due to rebound from a lower Bollinger Band and could be boosted by PepsiCo's earnings. Here's the chart in the morning, way oversold in the Bollinger Bands, due for a rebound. We got the rebound. Now what? Who knows? But we have NASDAQ rebalancing and the NASDAQ will have to buy Mondelez because they're underweight Mondelez. So this could be a good catalyst for the company. I own the name. A lot of you do too. Then we look at another one. MNST, Monster Beverages, similar to Mondelez and PepsiCo. The earnings should be encouraging for the stock to rebound. We'll look at the Bollinger Bands. This is what they looked like in the morning. Here's the update. We got the pop. We can continue here all the way to the 20 days moving average. Then that becomes a resistance. If we have a closing above, the chart shifts from being bearish to bullish. Then we have a few shorting ideas here. DAL, the earnings were, this is Delta Airlines, by the way. The earnings were very good, but already priced in. I'm looking to sell the news here. Here's the chart in the morning. Here's the update. Big engulfing candle. Sell the news, but sure it is overbought right now, as the hour sign, the MACD indicate. Can we go down to the 20 days moving average? Sure. But understand that the demand in buying this stock, the dip in this stock, will be hot. Because folks are going to look at the rear view mirror in the earnings that we just got. They say, oh, the CEO says the outlook will be upbeat. So they're going to buy the dip. But your eyes are going to be focused on what? Crude oil prices. If they rebound significantly higher, then the margin story for Delta will go kaputs. Then we got IWM out of the upper Bollinger Bands. So I'm fading the rip here. This is the chart in the morning. Here's the update. Another upside day, but outside of the Bollinger Bands. In other words, we're due for a pullback in the IWM. It is still bullish on an intraday perspective, but it's not going to happen without a pullback first. We have bank earnings tomorrow. Maybe the regional banks will pull back we see a pullback in the IWM. Then we have Meta. Here it is. Hard to stand against momentum, but this is the first time we've seen such divergence from the uh, Bollinger Band since last earnings report. I'm looking to open a trade here midday. Here's the chart in the morning. Absolutely insane. Absolutely dangerous as we head into earnings. This stock is priced for perfection and Zucchini can do whatever he want with the, you know, flexing his abs and pretending to be a tough guy, a UFC fighter, right? Maybe he wins the cock measuring match. Who knows? But at the end of the day, the expectations are way too high. And if the earnings are not pristine, you could see this stock down 10, 15, even 20% after hours rapidly. And it happened before, multiple times in Meta. Anyhow, here's the update. Another pop higher. But now we have the Doji, the indecision, perhaps a topping candle. But we should go down to the 20 days moving average. 
that could take us all the way down to let's say 290 and then we see what happens after earnings here's another one nwl for newell and by the way a couple of weeks ago if you looked at my show the sunday show in the unusual activities segment we spotted this trade right here newell was absolutely getting crushed Somebody bought massive call options on it, and since then, it absolutely blasted higher. But now, this is the morning chart outside of the Bollinger Bands, due for a pullback. But here's the update. We got a flattish day now. The assumption is that NWL should pull back, especially that we have earnings around the corner. You should see some de-risking here, and then we see what happens. And the last one is the XLF, as bank earnings kick in tomorrow. We could see de-risking after these stocks already rallied into the event. Here's the XLF in the morning. Here's the update. Still up but still outside of the Bollinger Bands. So the expectations for JPM are really high. They have to nail it tomorrow. Otherwise, we could see an ugly day in banks, and the regionals are not going to do pretty good. Now, let's do yesterday's morning brief, because we did not do that. And you can pause and read whatever you want, but I'm just going to do the charts here. BMY, high dividend paying stocks that is becoming oversold, due for a rebound. Here's the chart. Here's the update. It played out for five minutes and now BMY went down. I'm looking at it. I'm considering it because I have uh, some healthcare names in my portfolio, but some of them not doing pretty good. I could swap one of them, and some of you folks know which one that is, with BMY Bristol Myers. Oversold, at trend, it's a good company, pays good dividend, maybe takes a little dip down here to the trend line and then it rebounds. But I'm keeping an eye here on Bristol Myers. Then we have GDX, dollar sensitive. We know what happened after the CPI. The dollar went down. You got to go along GDX, gold miners. Here's the chart in the morning. Here's the update, big pop. But we're now outside of the Bollinger Bands. And you see the dollar really, really oversold today. My expectations are dollar is going to rebound. Gold will dip down. And we looked at the KRE. Again, if yields are going down because this was on CPI day. CPI came out uh, cool. Yields went down. Should be good for the KRE. This is the chart we looked at back then. Here's the update. Now we're at the upper Bollinger Bands. Can it go higher? Sure, but expectations are really high. If JPM doesn't do pretty good tomorrow, KRE could go down in a retest with the 20 days moving average or closing the gap. And then we have Verizon, high dividend. It should do pretty good when yields go down. Here's the chart back then. Expectations of a rebound. Here's the update. Did not work out pretty good. Verizon right now is a dead dog. I own the stock. It pays good dividend over 7%, but what is the point? Of losing 7% of the stock to get 7% in dividend. So it, it has to rebound. We have earnings around the corner and the stock better show up or it's going to get kicked out of the portfolio. And then we have XOM. We talked about how the dollar goes down. It's going to be good for energy, but a lot of energy is already overbought with the exception of XOM, Exxon Mobil. The expectations are we close the gap at 106.91. Here's what the chart looked like back then. And here's the update. Did pretty good. Until today, it went down because we got the news that Exxon is buying Denbury for about $5 billion. So a lot of spending here. They have a lot of cash. The expectations are, be it Exxon, Chevron, Shell, they're going to be spending a lot of money in share buybacks and dividends and in buying other companies. Now I said, look, if the dollar rebounds, then you got to look at the OIH, which is oil services. That's overbought. It should pull back. And this is the chart. This is what it looked like back then. But the dollar continued to go down. So here's the update. OIH still too hot. But the key word is too hot. It needs a pullback. So it's overbought. You want to avoid oil services right now because we have a pullback. The dollar is going to rebound. But if the dollar goes down, then you should be buying the dip in the OIH. And the last one is the XLI. Again, the dollar going down should be good for industrials, but they're overbought. So if we have any rebounds in the Dixie, XLI will go down. Here's the chart that I shared with you back then. Here's the update. It got a little outside of the Bollinger Bands, but it pulled back. And if the dollar rebounds tomorrow, the assumption is XLI should dip further. Then I shared some other ideas with you, which is MHK Mohawk. Now, if you watch the weekend video in the unusual activities segment, somebody bought Mohawk. Mohawk calls. And boy, was that a good trade. And I said, you got to follow it. The chart makes sense. Mohawk flooring. It's a laggard in the construction theme. It could be a good pick. This week alone, Mohawk is up by over 10%. Unbelievable. But is it out of whack right now? Yes, it is. We should see a pullback to 110. Here's the update. Mohawk may be forming a topping candle here, and it should go down to 110. The viewer says, hey, Maverick, you have a timing on when you would expect Mohawk to pull back to 110. Whatever expiration date you pick, it should include earnings. Not because you're going to hold all the way till earnings, but you want to capture the increase in implied volatility, number one. Number two, it gives you enough time with a catalyst. So you go down to 110, you book your profits, and my hunch is the company will do good because it's a laggard in the construction theme. And then here's another idea, MGM. 
way outside the Bollinger Bands, way overbought, due for a pullback. Here's the update. It pulled back a little bit today, but the expectations are it should pull back a little more. Anyhow, before moving on, let's talk about the market a little bit because we have the seasonality. Everybody talks about the seasonality. I think it's voodoo science, but anyways, you have to look at it. They say that usually the second half of July is where stocks top and they pull back. They consolidate for a little bit. Then we get September. September is an ugly month. It could coincide with a rebound in the CPI and Jackson Hole 2.0. Maybe tech earnings not doing pretty good. Maybe Nvidia blowing up because the 11 billion uh, revenue guidance is really hard to meet. We have a lot of landmines coming. So do we believe the seasonality here? The answer is you keep it in mind just as a reference, but you have to trade what's in front of you right now. And of course, you have your long-term thesis. Do you believe that this is a bubble or not? Is the bubble backed up by fundamentals or not? And make your investment decisions accordingly. Because when we look at when people say, hey, this is all about liquidity in the Fed, it's absolutely false. It's not about liquidity. It's about stupidity. Here's the S&P in yellow, and then you got the Fed liquidity in blue. We have a clear divergence here between liquidity and the S&P. And it says that we have a sell signal here. This is by Morgan Stanley. Now, in reality, if you use the RSP, the equal weight S&P, it's actually not that diverged from uh, Fed liquidity. But the reason why the S&P 500 is because of the weighting of the Magnificent Seven. Those in a bubble, irrational bubble, not backed up by any fundamentals at all. In construction, I can point out to you why uh, Owens Kerning, why Lennar, why Hubble, and many other names that I own in my portfolio did pretty good because they're backed up by the fundamentals. They have the pricing power. They're charging more and the demand is not waning at all. But you look at the AI bubble, the big guys, the earnings are actually down year on year. The revenues are down year on year. So that's a bubble. We'll see if we have the correction that we've been waiting for for a long time this summer as we get to earnings season or not. But the bottom line is, if you say, hey, follow the Fed, don't fight the Fed, follow the liquidity. The liquidity is down. Yet all of you guys are fighting the Fed just because they bailed out SVB. It's a divergence. And these kind of divergences, when they get fixed, it happens so rapidly, so aggressively, you're not going to have a chance of getting out in time. My advice is, I don't care what you do. You chase the mania, you fade the mania, you do whatever you want to do. But if you're in these magnificent seven names, please use some hedging strategies. You can use collar strategies. You sell a covered call, you buy a put, you can buy a naked put. There are many other strategies that you can use. But the last thing you want to see is you're up 100%, 150% in Meta or Tesla. These names after earnings, they go down big, 20% or so. Why eat the loss? Why not lock your gains? That's all I'm going to say. And with that, folks, moving on to the market coverage. And we begin with the closing of the indices today. And uh, here we go. The Dow Industrial Average up by 47.71 points or a gain of 0.14%. The Nasdaq up by 219.61 points or a gain of 1.58%. The S&P also positive by 37.88 points or a gain of 0.85%. We'll look at the sectors, green across the board, no laggards here, no shaming at all, but led by communication services and the AI mania. So in the last few days, it was good. We saw the rotation trade in charge. Now we're back to the AI mania. Doesn't mean that the rotation is not working. But it's not in charge today. Look at the breadth all in all. NYC, 72% advancing versus 27% declining. NASDAQ, 62% advancing versus 35% declining. Now, the breadth is really good. But once you get to the 70s in the NYSE, consistently now, day after day, you're going to have to go back to neutral. And that day could be as soon as tomorrow. On to commodities. Dollar goes down. You see appreciation in commodities, aka reinflation. We look at Brent, WTI, all closing with gains of almost 2% apiece today alone. Gasoline RBOB up along with heating oil, although natural gas took a pull back worth about 3% for the day. Even softs, we see coffee moving higher again, rebounding, so did sugar, but we have pullbacks here in OJ and cocoa, but cocoa been rallying higher for a long time now. Of course, the most sensitive commodities to the dollar are metals. Watch out what gold did today. See, gold is the old man. You gotta trust gold. The dollar is down today. Silver up big, platinum, palladium, copper, impressive gains for copper, 2.5%. But the old man is not too excited. What's up with that? The old man is saying, as it said, by the way, and predicted, keyword predicted, we covered that in the channel, that the dollar will go down, the CPI will be benign. Now gold is saying, watch out, we have a rebound in the Dixie. I'm not going to get too excited here. Matter of fact, I'm going to pull back. So we have an oversold rebound in the Dixie coming, and gold confirms that. Look at meats, laddish across the board, be it feed or cattle down, although lean hogs futures up by about 1%. And then impressive rebounds and gains across the board for grains, led by corn futures 
up a little over 3.5% for the day. Now, if the dollar rebounds tomorrow, we could see crude oil going down. But the case for crude, the long case for crude, got a lot stronger now. Number one, we talked about the SPR. This has to be refilled ASAP. It is way depleted right now. It's a national security threat. They have to refill it ASAP. We talked about the Saudis and OPEC Plus giving us support on the supply side. We talked about the dollar going down, giving us support on the demand side. Now we have even more support on the supply side from Russia. You see, right now they're allocating a lot of their barrels for domestic refineries, not for exports. You can see this illustrated here in the drop in seaborne crude exports from Russia. They're diving down. All in all, they're not really living to the cuts target that they promised, but exports are down. The production is down. So we have less supply from Russian crude. This is going to squeeze oil prices higher. And at some point, all of these oil shorts will not be able to hold. And we will see a big short squeeze in crude. On to the big casino options. What do we see here? The volume is up today, so we have a mania again. We have a meme mania and a lot of stacks, but we also have a gamma squeeze mania, although it's less effective than before. You know why? Because the implied volatility moved higher and the premiums are too expensive now. But still calls outweighing puts by a lot, which shows that we could be really close to an accident. All of this buying of calls, shorting of the VIX, no puts at all. We're begging for an accident to happen here. Now, the implied volatility is really important. We talked about Revion yesterday. A lot of folks see these names popping higher. And they say, okay, I missed the ratty. Now, I want to short it. But the problem is, if the IV rank is too high, then you're paying too much for the puts and the calls. The stack has to go down by 20% for you to make money. There's absolutely no point at all. The strategy you should be buying, for example, in Revion, we talked about this yesterday. You buy the shares, a thousand shares, cost you about 25,000 bucks. Then you ride these covered calls and you collect these really expensive premiums and you get out within the same day. They hit, the gamma squeeze gets you there. They hit, you sell your shares at a profit, and you pocket really impressive gain from riding these calls. Could be $1,000 a day, could be $2,000 a day. But then we have Coinbase, IV rank moving higher. Now it's a more expensive name. We can't really buy a thousand shares here unless you have $100,000 that you don't need right now. You can buy Coinbase and then sell shares, uh, excuse me, sell covered calls. But here's the problem. We look at the calls, they're really expensive right now. Let's say you want to chase. You buy the 110 calls. It's going to cost you about six and a half bucks. This is for the monthly expiration, by the way. It means for you to break even, the stock has to go up to 116 plus. It's too expensive, folks. Look at the puts if you want to short it. Let's say you buy the, uh, let's pick the 103 puts. For you to make money on those, you're going to pay about five and a half bucks. And the stock has to go down to 98 before you make some money. The premiums are too high. At the end of the day, the dealer ends up winning. So we'll just leave them alone. We'll look at the unusual activities that took place in the options market today. We start with the ticker CCJ. We talked about this in the live stream today. The chart looks good. Why not take a shot? Here's somebody taking a shot. 35 calls for the expiration date, July 28, with expectations that the name will pop higher by more than 8% by the expiration date. They paid about 20 cents a piece to enter this trade. All in all, spending about half a million dollars. Then we have a name that I own in my portfolio. A lot of you own too. SLB. It's been moving as of late, finally, and somebody betting for more gains to come. They bought the 61 calls for the expiration date, July 28th, with expectations. The name will go higher and gain more than 6% by then. They paid about 45 cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending about $1 million. Last but not least, what about MANU Manchester United? Somebody is betting for a pullback here. They bought the 21 puts, the expiration date, August 18th. Expectations, the stock will go down by more than 8.5% by then. They paid about one buck and 75 cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending about half a million dollars. We'll look at the heat map all in all. Pullbacks in healthcare, pullbacks in financials, pullback in the big energy names, pullback on some of the cyclicals. The industrials are pulling back a little bit. The action pretty much was uh, limited. The big caps, the chips, the software, technology. Some of the banks are rallying ahead of earnings. The dollar is down. So we see copper and metals. FCX, for example, doing pretty good. We see the Chinese names. Baba, JD, Pindudu, all up for the day. And of course, when we look at uh, defensives, lots of names moving higher based on PepsiCo's earnings and Conegra today. But all in all, the rotation is in the back seat today. The AI mania. Is back in charge and the evidence is right here look at large cap growth the iwf or the vug the all outperforming value vtv iwd they're outperforming mid caps mdy vo they're even outperforming the small caps iwm ijr so today it was the ai mania but it was also a little bit of the dollar driven rotation now energy is overbought so we see energy pulling back 
Same goes with the gold miners, GDX. Still positive, but it's getting really overbought. So each rotation has different sectors. The dollar rotation, for example, has energy, has metals, has the Chinese names. While we see energy and metals pulling back because they're overbought, we see Chinese equities doing pretty good. FXI, MCHI, all blasting higher. Besides that, it was a large cap growth kind of day, magnificent seven kind of day, but keep your eye on the VIX. You see the VIX proxies, VXX, that was up for the day. So we could have signals here that we're gonna pull back tomorrow. For that, we have to look at the chart and see what they say and then wrap it up. We start with SPY, an hourly chart, what do we see here? Another gap higher, and it's now trading above 446 and a half. But the closing candle was not that good from an hourly perspective. We know that the RSI and the MACD are all out of whack. They're due for a pullback. If we pull back tomorrow, we have to look back at 446 and a half. After that comes the gap. But of course, we're not going to see a reversal in trend until we see 430 loss of support. We have plenty of cushion between now and then. Look at the daily chart for the E-mini futures. What do we see here? Higher low, got us a higher high, all the way to my number at 45, 49 and a half. And now what? The RSI is still overbought. The MACD is still overbought. You can stretch this all you want, but the indicators say you're due for a 10% pullback. Now we need a fundamental catalyst. Could that be bank? Could that be a big cap technology stocks earnings? Could that be the Fed? Who knows? But we're looking for a fundamental catalyst to get us the garden variety pullback of 10%. Look at the cash index, SPX daily chart. What do we see here? Notice this important trend line. It acted as support and resistance before. Now we're at the trend line again. It also coincides with the resistance at 4,500. The bottom line is we need the 10% pullback we're due for this pullback. The higher the index goes, the bigger the pullback. It goes from 10 to 12 to 15. So a bit of pullback ASAP, a legitimate pullback. It shakes out the mania. It shakes out the excess. Then we get earnings and we see what happens. If we clean up the chart, SPX daily chart, we plug in the Bollinger Bands, we're outside of the Bollinger Bands again. The last time this happened was back in February and it gave us a pullback of about 10%. So again, when I say 10%, it's not out of the ordinary, folks. It's not perma bear to ask for a 10% pullback after this rally. And then we see what happens. We we'll look at the cues, narrowly chart, what do we see here? Got to the target of about 379. Not a good looking closing candle here. We'll look at the RSI, the MACD, we know all of them are overextended and due for a pullback. If we get a pullback, it could be a big one takes us all the way back to 373.82, perhaps all the way down to closing the gap. And then we see what happens. But the trend is not going to reverse unless the chart loses 357. We have a lot of cushion between now and then. So we have to look at the daily chart for the futures. What do we see here? Unfortunately, it did not get my uh, Maverick top. Otherwise, I would have retired. But instead, we got three soldiers. The question becomes, do we get the follow-up or do we get an engulfing candle, a big red engulfing candle that takes away the gains from today entirely? If that happens, then we got a solid signal that the seasonality is going to kick in and we see the second half of July where equities go down. But of course, you got to see a loss of 15,000 before you get comfortable that this is indeed a sticky pullback. Now we look at the NDX daily chart. We plug in the Bollinger Bands. We're out of the boundaries again. The last time we got this uh, kind of candle outside of the boundaries was back in February. And it got us yet again a pullback worth about 10%. Is it crazy to say that we have a 10% correction coming in the NDX? Of course not. Then we'll look at the IWM. Here it is, an hourly chart. You look at the RSI and the MACD, way overextended, due for a pullback. And we have support number one, 192. Then we have the gap, which coincides with around 189.75. And then we see what happens from there. Dollar. Daily chart, what do we see here? Without a doubt, the dollar is now negative, but it's way oversold. We're going to get a big rebound. What would be the catalyst for that? Who knows? It could be just the technicals, the algos. But if we get a rebound in the dollar, it's not going to be good for equities. And it's not going to be good for the old man gold. Here's gold broke above the wedge pattern above 1928. So far, so good. But we need a pullback, maybe a retest in 1928 and then see what happens. But gold is bullish now. Same goes with the SLV silver. Look at this big pop outside of the wedge closing above 21.57. You chase it now if you missed it. The answer is no. Let the dollar rebound. Let this one go down. Maybe close some gaps, retest some support, and then pick it up. Here's Brent Oil. So far, so good. Above 80.27. The problem is the dollar is going to rebound. You should see a dip here. If the dollar then goes down again, you should be buying the dip in oil. Here's the two-year yield daily chart. What do we see here? Broke the trend. Down almost at support at around 4.59. Now, we know the dollar is going to rebound sooner than later. Will yields rebound though? What if we get a bad reading from JPM tomorrow? Now, I think yields will go down. If that is the case, 
TLT could move higher. But it's still, it has a long way to go here. It has 103.5. And, and of course, I'm not going to buy it until we see 109.5 broken as resistance. VIX daily chart. We got to 17.808, excuse me, which is, by the way, the gap before the pandemic pop. So we know it's a really stiff resistance here. We got a rejection. It pulled back. Now, it closed positive by the end of the day. Is this a leading indicator that the VIX is about to pop and give it another shot at 17.08? My hunch is absolutely yes. Then we'll look at the Big Kahuna Apple hourly chart. What do we see here? Got to the resistance twice. Couldn't make it. But did it break 189.60? The answer is no. So we don't have the confirmation yet. But it's still the laggard. You see all of these AI main names moving higher. Apple not so hot so today. So we have to zoom out to the daily chart. Use the Bollinger Bands. We were looking for a pullback all the way to the 20 days moving average. We got that exactly. Now we have indecision. Doji after Doji. And when the chart does this, this, it's given the opportunity for buyers to show up. But so far, the buyers are not showing up. Conclusion, if they don't, we're going to go down. And if Apple breaks the 20 days moving average, it's going to be a big deal. Because the last time it did that, it was back in uh, February and also March, the SVB collapse. A closing below the 20 days moving average means the trend is changing. We look at Tesla, 30 minutes chart. We talked about 276.47. Yesterday, the chart got exactly almost to the penny to this number and it faced rejection forming a bear flag pattern. Today we got a gap higher in the morning, but we played the bear flag, showing a lower low. Then demand showed up and they closed above 276.47. Now the bulls would look at this as yet another inverse head and shoulder formation. The bears would say, wait a minute here, it was an ugly closing candle, the RSI is overbought, you're gonna lose 276.47 tomorrow. Now who wins this argument? The answer is, did we close above or below? 276.47. The answer is we closed above, so the bulls have the advantage. The bears can turn the table tomorrow. Last but not least, what about tulips? Bitcoin, what do we see here? Daily chart. It was a mania day in cryptos. All of these shit coins moved higher because of the SEC. They lost the ruling, of course. Genius Gary Gensler. And we saw massive bid in cryptos. But Bitcoin, still tame. Is it lagging? Sure. Is it sniffing a rebound in the dollar? Maybe. But it's a suspicious reaction here. It closed positive. Don't get me wrong here. Closed positive above 31,000. But after the dollar went down big, after the ruling for the SEC, my expectations were we should have seen a bigger pop. We'll see if it is a lag or Bitcoin is sending a warning sign here that damn we go in cryptos. We'll see. Lastly, moving on to the conclusion of this video, what do we have on the economic calendar tomorrow? We have the import price index along with consumer sentiment from the University of Michigan. And with that, folks, this is all I got for you for tonight. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. And I will talk to you again tomorrow. Good night.